Colossians 3, verse 1 through 11. <clears throat> if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will, will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In those you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Welcome to the po Post Mill Podcast. Can't even say it right. <laughs> Engaging the culture with God's justice with Scott and Pete. Yes. And I guess we should just do some shameless plug. This episode brought to you by CircleVLeather.ca. Oh, right on. Who donated all the equipment. But yeah. it's, of course, your equipment. And so the, uh, the Bible and binding the Bible and stuff. And... Goatskin leather. Yeah. Yeah. It's the good stuff. We do like leather. Right. And apparently, um, if you're stuck out in the wilderness, out in the bush, and you're hungry and you can't find any food, apparently you can suck on leather and it'll mm -hmm. get you through. So yeah. you can chew your belt. Eskimos did that too. They would, nice. they were starving. They would eat their dog harnesses and they wouldn't eat their stuff. dogs. Well, yeah. You have first the dogs and then the dog harnesses. Oh, first the dogs, then the dog yeah. harnesses. Okay, yeah. okay. And then their jackets, and that oh. was it. Okay, all so, right. Yeah, yeah it and is then... edible. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. It's good stuff. Uh, I probably will avoid it, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't sound that nice. Um, anyway, so yeah, it'd be good to to maybe um, start off by maybe talking a little bit about uh, our ministry. Um, this podcast is, has been birthed out of a ministry that we have in the city of Lethbridge, which is a, a street evangelism ministry. <clears throat> um, started it a couple of years ago. We have a large uh, homeless population here in Lethbridge, and we have um, a high level of drug use in yeah. Lethbridge. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a site that would uh, that people could come to to take their uh, illegal drugs and that they would be monitored and watched during that time and this is where we started doing our ministry and it kind of burst out from that and uh, we do a lot of evangelism sharing the gospel sharing the love of Christ with people and uh, and trying to do justice for those on the streets and uh, and yeah with evangelism we've we've started a small little church gathering out of it and now, mm -hmm. of course, we have the podcast in order to kind of try to get um, our perspective mixed with God's law out a little bit more into the society. Apparently, people are watching. Yeah. So, yeah. Hope it's helpful, yeah. So that maybe we can engaged. talk a little bit about what's been happening in the last couple of weeks. You, you were out last, last weekend and I was out last night. Yeah. So why don't you... Last week was a, a, a bit of a disaster because the... The sewers were down on, I think it was Thursday already. So the soup kitchen was backing up into the shelter. Mm. So when we got there Sunday, it was just the three of us, or the four of us, and then KP came later. But it was starting to rain and blow really bad. Mm. And the sh shelter workers, and there was police there. Ambulance came later, so they were moving people away, you know, and then it started raining. And so we couldn't really do much. But then Bill came in. Bill Ginter, and it was a disaster in there because they hadn't done dishes right since the sewer plugged. Yeah. So what we did was cleaned up the soup kitchen because they had dug excavated a hole and got down to the pipe. Yeah. So we were pailing out the sinks and dumping it in the hole. And we did about four wagon loads of wow. water and cleaned everything up. And mm. 
So I don't. I haven't heard if it's going net. You were there Friday. Yeah, I, I went there yesterday, and it has been cleaned up yeah. now. And I think yeah, they fixed that problem. Um, uh, the thing that disappointed me about the whole thing <clears throat> is, from your report, it's like, well, the shelter is backed up with sewage. Nobody can use the bathroom. Actually, it had flooded the floor in the shelter. Yep. So that the only place that people could sleep that wasn't covered in sewage was in the soup kitchen dining room. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of overcrowded. Outside the soup kitchen, there was all the people that had been setting up tents and they were staying outside. But then some people had then obviously left there to try to find more space than they would go into the park. The police came and bulldozed everything, tore everything yep. around, threw everybody's stuff away. Uh, started giving tickets. Um, there, there, there's nowhere for these people to go. Yeah, because we talked to Willie that the week before, and he was putting in 12-hour days working for the right. cement yeah. basements. And he said, too, he was just going to try to go sleep in the park. Yeah. And he could usually sleep till about 11.30, and then he got kicked out and usually got fined yeah. six bucks. Six bucks. Six dollar fine or something like that. Doesn't matter if you've got no money, I guess. Yeah. Doesn't matter how much it is. So, and then he was going to try from there, I guess, go to the soup kitchen and sleep there again or something. Right. I don't know. But it's pretty tough. Yeah. Cause, and, and then when we were cleaning the dishes and everything, they were, the police were there and they were moving. Yeah. And everybody, they had a big tent set up there before. Yeah. That was all gone. Yeah. Tore that all down. And Yeah. So there's no place for these people to go. No. And, and, and it, just the how long it took like it took a week to get that sewer going again right because it was i think it was down thursday or friday yeah i think it was thursday and then it was they didn't they said probably by tuesday we should have it going yeah so you know that that's i find that ridiculous that it would take yeah. that long um to get that cleaned up yeah it's, and it's tough for the for the soup kitchen people too you know to be yeah. Working under them conditions, a yeah. large kitchen like that, and you yeah. can't clean anything. and You can't do dishes. You can't wash. Yeah. Uh, well, you can. It needs to be done. It got done. Yeah. Um, right? So, you know, it's it's good that, that, that the people made the sacrifices to make that happen. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes when you have a problem, um, you just got to find the solution. There's no point in complaining about it mm -hmm. when you've got a problem that is right in front of you at that moment. You just, yeah, you, just you have to go and find the solution. I think that's one of the things that um, has been stripped away from us uh, recently as the world becomes more and more dependent on people taking care of them. Uh, you know, the government needs to do this. The city needs to do that. You know, yeah. that it takes away the ingenuity of of us as our, in our little groups in order to be able to step up and just solve the problem. Mm -hmm. without asking permission um, yeah and, and that's what we had discussed too you know and we, i think we said it on our first podcast we believe that you know christians should be dealing with this right because the government is is just not going to do it you know it's not the government's job no. the government's job is to do justice in society yeah. and just this and nothing more that's romans 13 1 through 6 and yeah. um often very often misunderstood by christians that the modern socialist state, um, the government does everything, mm -hmm. but there's other spheres of influence. We were talking about it last week with our interview with Stephen C. Perks, is that there are other spheres of influence. You've got the yes. individual sphere, you've got the church sphere, you have family. the family sphere, and you could even put in things like private industry, business, and yeah. different things like that, that, and charities that should, should be stepping into the spaces, leaving the government free, to be able to do what they need to do, what they've been commanded to do, which is to do justice, to uphold the law in in a society. And when they try to do other things, they don't do it well because it's not their job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and even I've been talking to other people, family members and stuff too, but a lot of people don't realize, you know, what's happening on the street. They're, they just think it's a bunch of lazy people that are on drugs that, and of course, that element is there, but a lot of it is there's mental issues. Yeah. And there's absolutely no place for people with mental issues to go anymore. There's right. no care for them. And, and that is the duty of the church. Right. You know, when they, when, when the family 
can't take care of their members, then the ch it's the church's sphere of authority yeah. to take care of the widows and the orphans. Absolutely. And and that has to be done. And, and you can see it's just a disaster out yeah. there, you know. And the government doesn't know what to do and um, a lot of injustice. Mm -hmm. So that's sad to see. But we had a good talk with a fellow on mm. Friday night. Um, it was interesting because he was talking about a lot of spiritual stuff, how he uh, receives things and stuff, and we were able he receives to... messages, yeah, from the netherworld. So we went to, <clears throat> I pointed out in uh, one John where it says, mm. you know, test the spirits, right? You know, to make sure that yeah, the spirits are of God because you don't want to be dealing with demonic spirits or mental issues, right? You have to uh, go back to the Word of God, and he was very receptive, like. You can tell sometimes when you're talking to somebody if, if they're listening or not. Yeah. A lot of times people are yeah. just zoned out yeah. and waiting to answer back. Yeah. But he was really, really listening. And then you said you talked to him last yeah, night again? I, I did. Um, one, one of the things that I, uh, that I find that it's probably impor really important to, to try to communicate to Christians is that when you're on the streets talking to someone that have mental health issues plus a drug addiction, like on onto hard drugs, mm -hmm. that there is a there's a big connection between um, the drug addiction and the spiritual realm. Uh, I think Christians think, well, no, this person's just talking crazy. They just got mental health issues. There's something wrong. Mm -hmm. Need counseling or something like that. But don't discredit the amount <clears throat> of. Um, <clears throat> When, when, you, when you take drugs, you separate yourself from reality a little bit. But in, in a sense, you almost step into a slightly more real world, uh, which is a spiritual world. Now, you're not interacting in a good way with the spiritual world, right? But you're entering into a space where you're interacting with demons without knowing it. So when someone says, I saw this and that, and you think... This guys mm -hmm. it's like well no you actually have to listen there's probably more than likely that they're seeing something like that um if you think about uh various different uh religions of the past and even religions today um there's uh like native religions down in in the southern states which use peyote and dmt in order to engage with spirits yeah and uh i mean even in deuteronomy 13 or 18 it basically condemns sorcery, but the, the root word is pharmakeia, which is where we get the word pharmaceutical from. So back then, uh, they would take substances in order to yep. uh, worship these false Wait. gods, which eventually we realize are, are demons, right? Yeah, like it's like you're, even with Far Eastern religions, meditation and stuff, right. it's like you're opening yourself up. right. For demons yes you know and and that's what the right. drug is doing too right yeah so you can't necessarily say that just it's all in their head you know no, this is why you have to say yeah. okay there's something else to it you're you this person is interacting on a spiritual level with something that's not good for them it's a just it's distracting them away from the truth and it's also manipulating them and keep them keeping them in slavery mm -hmm. now this same jesse fellow that you had mentioned last week I saw him last night and he was really upset because he lost all of his stuff. It had all been stolen or yeah. taken away. I don't know if the police bulldozed it or someone stole it, but he was mm. so upset because last night he overdosed and passed out and he was on death's door, yeah. but someone from the Alpha House came out and, and gave him um, um, Noxalone or yeah. whatever and brought him back. And he was so upset, he just wanted to die. And at that point, I was like, okay, well, there's, there's no point in <laughs> beating around the bush here. I was like, okay, I got I to gotta present the gospel like straight out to you yep. right now. Like maybe God brought you back in mm -hmm. order to give you grace so that you can recognize your need for him. He loves you so much. He died for your sin. He brought you back to give you another chance to hear the gospel, repent and believe and turn, right? Because we know that the wages of sin is death and we're all going to die one day, but we don't want to stand before God 
with our own righteousness. No. You don't want to stand in front of God with all of your good works, which really are nothing, just filthy rags, the Bible says. You need to stand before God with the righteousness of Christ on you and the new life, right? That Christ has paid for your for the penalty of your sin and your death, right? And he died for you so that you can live. And and it, I think it really affected him. It really impacted him. A lot of the time, people kind of talk and they try to deflect and stuff. But he yeah. just listened and agreed. And I asked him a few questions and, you know, like he really agreed with that. And, you know, so he's going to come on Sunday and I got him a Bible. And I gave him a Bible last time too. He had it stolen. Probably whatever, was all right? stolen. So, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's... Because we gave him the track too, um, the freedom track, right? And mm -hmm. asked him to read that, but but it's that same idea. Is is like you say, it's surrendering to God, right? Giving yourself over to God, right? And instead of you know, like because a lot of them know a lot, they talk about Jesus, yeah. they read their Bibles sometimes, but they don't have that full surrendering. They still want their sin. Right, and they'll take, take God, too. You know, and that's always a danger. And then even in a week's time, you know, because we 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 talk to him about the gospel quite clearly too. He's very mm -hmm. receptive. But then you see what happens. Right. You know, he almost dies by overdose. It's just well, sin is a slavery, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's you just can't, enslavement. It's... You can't get out of it yourself. You know, uh, like Jesus has opened the door. Mm. Um, but you don't realize that the lock is off and that you you can just open it open the door and step through in faith yeah. um, and you're not going to get out of the prison yourself like Jesus has to pull you out it's not like I've opened the door please come it's like he has to come into the prison grab yeah. you by the scruff of the neck and drag you out yeah right that's a, a true picture of of being freed from sin because nobody willingly steps out of their sinful life. They, we love our sin. This is why we go back to yep. it all the time. Regardless of how much it hurts us, we go back to it all the time, time and time again. Non-Christians and Christians do it alike. Yes. But Christians are forgiven. Christians are being transformed. Um, and that the new love for God is building in, in your heart more and more and more and pushing the old desires out. Yeah. Right? But it's definitely, you can see that. It, it has to be the work of the Spirit of God. Like, um, and I think sometimes that's a can be a huge fault on our part, even that, is that we're not spending enough time mm -hmm. in prayer, mm -hmm. um, expecting the Spirit of God to do the work. You know, yeah. Because I mean, you can talk to these people, give them Bibles, read to them, but ultimately, it's yeah. not by might or power; it's by my Spirit. Right. You know, they have to be awoken by the Spirit of God, yeah. and and we as Christians have that responsibility of right. of um, praying to God that he would use his spirit to convict them of sin, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a big responsibility as a, as a Christian too, that, that we're living in the spirit, sure. you know, that we're not grieving the spirit, you know, that God will, will use us, right. You know, it's a, uh, it's a thing that, I can often forget that we're not relying on the Spirit of God right. more to to create a change, because you can see it, it's if they're not convicted of sin, you know, if if God doesn't open their eyes, right. that they see their condition, um, it's nothing's going to happen. Yeah, you know, because we're we're fallen creatures. Yeah, we're we're blind for we're blind for our our situation. Yeah, you know, and we and we can't get out of that unless. There's conviction, because a lot of times, uh, Christian before he's saved, he comes to an end of trying to save himself. Yeah. You know, there there comes a point where there's total hopelessness. Right. And then you reach out to Christ because that's right. your only hope, eh? But yeah. these people are already in such a hopeless situation, right. and they still can't get out of it because they don't. The Spirit of God has to create that conviction. Yeah that there will be a repentance and a turning yeah. and, and a seeking out that our only hope is in Christ, right? Yeah. He's done all the work for us. So it's just a matter of letting go of our idols, of our yeah. sinful life and and being changed. So I think that's a 
a big thing we should um having prayer meetings and yeah. and stuff like that to really that we're really relying on the spirit of mm -hmm. god to do the work eh? i think what we do as christians is we tend to go back and forth between spending time in prayer and then spending time in action and i think mm -hmm. the more modern <clears throat> pietistic church is more um concerned with praying praying all that the time that can be a problem too yeah not necessarily praying in the right direction because they don't understand the progression of of uh the kingdom of god in history that it's supposed to be uh, leavening or growing mm -hmm. throughout history and it grows through the church and it's it, expanded through the church's action so god is sovereign but god ordains not only the end which is for people to be saved his elect to be saved but also the means in which that happens and that yes. happens through the faithful preaching of the word and also asking god to apply that word of god yeah. to people's hearts so so god puts it in us to pray and then we pray back to him and ask and and he answers our prayer by saving right so yeah. i think that we probably have recognized the um the lack of action within the church yeah so we're stepping out to do the action but sometimes i think that even we especially with our group we can sometimes ne neglect the prayer aspect it's time to stop and just ask the lord please yeah will you uh will you transform right yeah so. and i believe like god puts burdens on people's hearts yeah you know because it's his work and so yeah. he'll um, put that burden on your heart that you will pray and will go out, you know, and and spread the word. That's isn't that the ultimately God's work in everything. Isn't that the proper um, meaning of Proverbs three? Um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Yeah. So, like, if you're trusting in Him. It's not like he gives you the desires of your heart, like, oh, I wish I had a Lambo, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, right? It's like, oh, I wish, I used to wish I had a Lambo, but I have a new desire, Yeah. right? He's gonna make that path straight. He's going to uh, show me the way to go, show me the way to pray yeah. as per his will, not my own um, maybe fleshly or sinful desires. Yeah. Right? So, and that's what I was saying, like even with the Spirit of God working in Christians, mm. there should be that number one desire should be that God's name is glorified right. and that sinners are saved, right? And if God works that in us, then we want to get out and share the gospel with everybody right. and then also pray and, yeah. and get in that right relationship with God that He will empower us right. to be the means absolutely that really you know and that's i think that's really important and like you said in both ways people that go out can sometimes forget the prayer part and right. other people can just concentrate on um, on doing nothing and just praying <laughs> yeah know? yeah you right. have to work and pray yeah. yeah no that's good um we definitely need change in our city and uh, probably the best one of the best ways that if you're a Christian in Lethbridge is to maybe think about voting for Bill Ginther. Um, oh yeah, look at so that. He's Bill Ginther it. is the um, is the director of the soup kitchen, and he's a good friend of ours, and uh, he's also running for city council. So he understands the homeless problem. He's been in it for a long time, um, the homeless and and drug addiction and everything like that. And he's always one of these people who are there for as an advocate. Mm -hmm. or justice for people like that so uh it would be a, definitely be a good person to vote for i'm voting bill ginther for councillor on october 18th mm -hmm. are you um <laughs> he he messaged me yesterday and he's like can i put a law and sign on your property i'm like yeah sure no problem right definitely want to be able to support him in that um, yeah and i think that's a good way like i wouldn't put all my hope in the government doing anything but i believe that christians like bill and every christian should be involved right in the political sphere but it's ultimately um i still believe it's the church's duty yes to take care of the this problem but yeah you know we should be uh 
the Christians should be involved in politics. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Getting and involved. I, I was listening to the politics of God and the politics of man yesterday as I was working. And uh, Stephen said something important in that, which was basically when it comes to Christians in politics, we shouldn't be lobbying government to do more Christian things. We should be lobbying government to step back and give up their powers yeah. in order for um, ministries and and various different charities and Christian organizations and churches to step in and fill that gap. Yeah. Right. So there should be more government doing less. Mm -hmm. Right. If that makes sense. Right. We should be lobbying the government only to step back from yeah, what they're and, doing. And that's important about the uh, spheres or the structures of authority. Sphere of sovereignty. The, yeah. It should be like the three main ones, church, state, and family. And and he explains that really good in his yeah. in his book. And uh, we can maybe bring that up yeah, another we could, time and yeah. post a link to the book. It's, it's well worth a read because it makes so much sense right. how the... Uh, and, he, and he brings that all out of that Christ has ultimate authority. Absolutely. And if you have a state that has all the authority, that's idolatry, right? right? Because and he, he delegates that authority in parts to his image bearers in different areas, yeah. but not all of it to one. Exactly. Right. Not one sphere yeah. has total authority, Absolutely. only Christ. And if you think that through and you see their duties, their limits of authority, it mm -hmm. all makes so much sense mm -hmm. that you think, why mm. are we not just following the creator of the world's order? Right. You know, like he listed in, in yeah. the Bible that it's insanity not yeah. to do that, especially as a Christian. You know, how many Christians know or understand this? I never knew. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's a recent, recent um, knowledge for me to have gained yeah. sphere sovereignty. But it makes so much sense. And, and especially if you're seeing all the problems in society. Yeah. Um, because you wanted to touch on, well, yeah, I some think this critical race and stuff. I, I, I what's think this um, tie, this leads in really nicely to what I was thinking about um, over the last week or so, and what I wanted to talk about today. Now, this um, episode isn't necessarily super well planned out. It's more a lot of thoughts, and mm -hmm. we're definitely plebs. We don't know uh, half the time what we're talking about or at least i feel like i don't know what i'm talking about yeah. i do know the word of god and i do understand god's law and i think that when you understand uh, god's law god's uh, progression in history what he's doing and how he's doing it i think that you can apply that to all areas of life and that you can find the truth in that i don't know all the history I, you know yeah. there's you know I, I i've seen some comments come up on the youtube uh some of the other videos well, what are you talking about here or there it's like yeah, I'm not saying have all the specific answers or no. I don't know, you know, there's other places that something's working that's not working here. I don't know, right? You know, you can disagree, but at the end of the day, we have the word of God yeah. and it is the answer rightly applied to everything, all of life's Definitely. problems. Right? And I think one, one thing about this podcast too is we don't want to be spouting our opinions right. per se, you yeah. know, like we don't want it to become like an opinionated right. thing. Like you say, we're based on the word of God yeah. and we're open to discussion. And I think it'd be cool if people commented and yeah. asked questions and, and hate on our podcast. I mean, you, the more you hate on the podcast, the more interactions it gets. And yeah, hey, and, but I know, think that's more people watch it. Because it's not about us. It's not <laughs> yeah. our opinion. Yeah. We just want to go back to a biblical sure. understanding, biblical Christianity, yeah. you know, based on what God says in his word. Right. So this, this, uh, has come out of, uh, I've just gotten back from holiday. So we'll just kind of tell it like a story. Uh, we went on holiday for 10 days. We went into British Columbia uh, last, or well, the beginning of this year, we bought an RV, right? We, it's an older RV, right? It's like a 454 gas Ooh. Chevy RV. You know, it's got everything, everything works for the most part. Had to mm -hmm. hit it with a hammer a few times to get it started in the morning. But for the most part, it was it was good. We drove out to BC. We spent some time in Kimberley. It's beautiful out there, mining town. Then we went further in, went to Nelson. Cult, a beautiful city, culturally very, very different than here. And then we went up to Caslow. And the reason we, that we went to Caslow is that my wife, Rochelle, is of Japanese descent and that she's always wanted to um, see where her grandmother and grandfather 
were interned during mm-hmm. the Second World War and to go to the museum and learn a bit more about the history and the culture that um, of the Japanese people who had... Uh, so a little bit of history there when it comes to uh, Japanese in Canada. And again, I don't know everything, but the Japanese had been uh, been immigrating from Japan. And there wasn't that many of them, um, you know, a, a few thousand or a few tens of thousands had come. And uh, they were living in the lower mainland in Vancouver, pretty much. And they had um, built up a, uh, they built a life for themselves. They built houses, they'd taken this wasteland and they turned it into farming land and and then the war comes along and there was a concerted effort through the government and the culture at the time to basically scare the populace that there was the Japanese were a problem mm-hmm. and now some of these Japanese my wife's grandparents both of them were born in Canada so they were Canadian yeah. citizens their parents had immigrated but their parents were all there so large families and I, I mean, I've got pictures. I took photographs of like government propaganda that was put in like posters that were put in up or put into the <clears> newspapers <throat> saying that the war is now upon us and we've got to deal with these Japanese because these Japanese are bad people. And uh, what they did, the government then rounded everyone up, said, pack your bags. Yep. You're going to jail, essentially. So they took them from the lower mainland and took them way into the interior of B.C., put them on a cold lake and basically locked them away from society. Mm-hmm. Um, now, it's it's one of these things where... Uh, now, of course, the Japanese people made the best of it. Like yes. They absolutely made the best of it. They did what they could. Um, and eventually, many of them got moved again uh, to Alberta and various other places. And again, to have to start over. Many of them died, froze to death in the winter and stuff like that. Their land that they had that was theirs in the lower mainland, which is, you know, million dollars a square foot property now that was theirs, is essentially stolen and they didn't get it back. And uh, the government made reparations with them for the tune of like 20 grand in 1988 or something like that. It wasn't much. Yeah. Right. Um, I I mean, at least it was something. But it, it brings to mind... If that can happen in Canada, what's the difference? Now, this might sound extreme. People might not like this. But what's the difference between what the Canadian government did to the Japanese and what the the Nazi German government did to the Jewish people? There is not a lot of difference in my mind with the propaganda that they pushed. The only difference being how far they took it. The Germans took it to essentially murdering these people, at least six million of them. Exterminating, yeah. Right? But the Canadian government, first of all, they kidnap them, move them to a different place, to an internment camp, which is like a concentration camp. Yeah. But the Canadian government didn't kill them at the end of the war. They set them free. But, like, statism has an ugly head. The only difference I would see in that is that the Germans instigated it, Whereas the Canadian government did it because the Japanese declared war. So right. that would be the only difference I could see. But it, the idea is still that the government can take a group of people right. and, and separate them. Yeah. And I think in that t- in them times too, a lot of people were scared of the Japanese. Yeah, there was, And, and maybe the government created that fear right. because the Japanese are at war now mm-hmm. and any Japanese is a potential right. enemy, even though they were been living born in canadian right. so you know which which and, and i think there was a lot of that with the italians even and and german speaking people also in canada during the second world war there was but as i was but they reading weren't... and researching that there were german people that were born in germany that, that were now living in um in canada and the u.s mm-hmm. that didn't receive the same treatment that really? the japanese did right you know, like, okay, well, these white people, they, we recognize them, we understand, like, it's a different okay. culture, but now these Japanese people, obviously, they're different, they look so different, they have a different religion, they were too different, too scary. Type of racism gets It involved. was a type of racism yeah. that, uh, that basically caused, well, I mean, there was riots in the, in the early 1900s, after the First World War, before the Second World War, where people went into Chinatown and completely smashed the whole place up. And mm-hmm. then there was Japantown next to Chinatown. Yeah. And 
And the Japanese actually had to fight off the rioters to stop them smashing up the businesses. Mm. Right. So there was already that sentiment going on yeah. within the, the country. And now it's interesting because, you know, of course, you can find um, videos of Hitler declaring his love for Jesus and all this yeah. stuff. But also you can look at Canada and Canada on the parliament building has Psalm 72 verse 8. He shall have dominion from sea to sea. And so that sets Canada as a Christian nation. Obviously, it came out of Great Britain and the uh, British Empire. And it was a Christian empire, at, at least Christian in law, mm -hmm. but full of or mixed with Christians and non-Christians. And as the society becomes less and less Christian, you have um, non-Christian people in power operating under Christian law and bringing a bad name to yeah. Christ and doing things that are not found in God's law. Yeah. Right. Because we were referencing some, some verses here. <clears throat> and this, maybe this is something that we can talk about in a later date, but when it comes to borders and law, th there's really no such th in the Bible, at least there's no such thing as a physical border with border guards. It does. It doesn't exist. The borders equals law. And if you have a law of the land, this is a Christian country. This is Christian law, mm -hmm. right? Which is for justice for all men, yeah. right? Justice and, and, and righteousness, it's good. Everybody should be able to follow that law, right? So if you come in as a foreigner and break that law, you tried under that law. Yeah. But at the same time, foreigners that come in need to be treated uh, righteously, justly, according to that law as well. It doesn't, you can't. You can't change it. It's the mm -hmm. law. No. So some of the verses that we were talking about, um, Leviticus 24, 22, you are to have the same standard of law for the foreign resident and the native, for I am the Lord your God. If a foreigner dwelling among you wants to observe the Passover of the Lord, they want to go to church, right? It is to be done so according to the Passover statute. There was certain rules for the Passover and its ordinances. You are to apply the same statute to both the foreigner and the native of the land, right? Yeah. Your assembly is to have the same statute, both for you and for the foreign resident. It is a permanent statute for the generations to come. You and the foreigner shall be the same before the Lord. We're not to treat people by a complete, ah, you know what? That's a Japanese person. You know what? That's a Jew. Whatever it is, whatever line you want to draw mm -hmm. up, you're not to then take that person and kidnap them and then place them in a camp or a prison or something like that for no, no reason. For no reason, just because they're different than you. Just because they're different than yeah. you. Or you're scared of them or you're thinking that they're all yeah. spies, which is crazy. Some of the Japanese fought in some of the wars. Yeah. Oh, I right? know. And, and, you know, so... It's, it's crazy. But, yeah. The... um. That's the problem when you when you forsake the word of God and and you because with this they 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 were allowed in the country they were allowed to partake of all the good yeah. of Israel but if they broke the law mm -hmm. they were you right. know under that law they were uh, convicted of yeah. course right and mm -hmm. but well how do you see that then for like a modern country like when you have illegal immigrants coming in. Um, a lot of them are, are criminal, you know, there's yeah. a lot of that happening, but there, there has to be, you would think some kind of acknowledge, acknowledgement of, you know, this is Canada and right. you can't just come in and go on welfare. Well, you know, I mean, again, it, 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 how does that relate to modern well, times? It, so it, first of all, you know, like we have to reassess everything. Does our modern nation state model resemble anything close to what the the nations around Israel look like? Nothing at all. Like, no, like to come on no. welfare. Well, it shouldn't be welfare, right? Like that's the yeah. government handing that's money <laughs> from taxpayers to someone else. That shouldn't be a thing. So there's that argument debunked yeah. right there. It should be family primarily and potentially church if there's no family available to take care of homeless and sick people. Yeah. Right. That should be the primary uh, social um, support system. Right. So borders, we, you know, the border will try to stop you and check you at the border. And should you be allowed in and all this stuff? And you can't work in this nation. 
why not? Like, so because you'll take I, jobs from Canadians. Yeah, but I mean, but but the thing is, is that some of these other countries are so destroyed that other people want to come in order to be actually actually make a living, right? Yeah. So, like, if you're in a country like, for example, Nicaragua, that you there's gangs everywhere, mm-hmm. right? And you you. They come and they'll walk into your house and say, where's our money? You owe us 50% of your wage. This is how much you need to give. Like, yeah. People want to get away from that. And quite rightly, I would For too. Sure. Yeah. Right? So the border, so while I understand the border and I get the border, and I, I'm not trying to say that we should rip the borders down completely, right? Because God's word always finds something as a, a third or alternative to what we have. You've got the modern conservatives in the States, especially like the Republicans, who want a big wall the whole way across the Southern border. Mm-hmm. Then you've got the Democrats that want to just completely tear it down and just have open borders and just come on in. Yeah. Well, actually you're both looking at this completely wrong. You need to re completely reconstitute your entire society. Your borders should be law. You don't enforce the law in your no. country. We don't enforce the law very well in our country. Not at all. Right? So if somebody is a murderer and they decide to come in to the country and they are going to commit those crimes, they need to be punished according to that. Once the word gets out that this country plays by God's law and doesn't play when it comes to murder, rape, kidnapping, yep. theft and all this stuff, and they actually deal with it the way that God's law prescribes, there's going to be a whole heck of a lot less of people doing it. Yeah, you, it's if a you deterrent, want to definitely. carry on doing yeah. your you're raping and murdering, well, you better stay in the country that has no law. Yeah. Regardless of, of whether it has borders or not, right? Yeah. Because if you want to come to um, Canada, if you want to go to El Salvador or wherever, right, and start a Bitcoin only business or something like that, you should be able to. Mm-hmm. But you follow the laws of the land. Yeah. Right? I, I, of course, if, if the the laws of the land are biblical laws, right? Like not just made up dumb laws, right? But but this is the way that it should be, right? And mm-hmm. and we've done a great disservice to so many people throughout history when we treat them differently, especially in Christian nations. I mean, we're, we're living in Canada. There's been um, all kinds of problems when it comes to how uh, First Nations or Native people have been treated in this country. And they will, many of them will look and say, well, you call yourself a Christian. Look, exactly. this is what, what the Christian nation is, has done to us. But it's Christian in name only. Yeah, it's not biblical Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity. Yeah. And, it, and it blasphemes the name of God. Absolutely. It does. Right, so now yeah. everybody hates the, the name of Christ and the idea of Christ. But it's a Jesus that doesn't exist. They hate a Jesus that they think exists. Yeah. Well, this isn't the God that created them. This no. isn't the God that loves them. Who has one law for all men which is to first of all worship him and second of all love your neighbor yeah love god and love neighbor that's god's law yeah and it starts with love god right because if you don't have that you don't love your neighbor you know that's you eat your neighbor <laughs> yeah you destroy right? or you him. steal from your neighbor or whatever right yeah. so yeah so it, it's been a it's been an interesting thought process for me i obviously don't have all the answers specifically but but what it gets back to and racism is a big part of it but there's also you know genderism and religionism and no matter what the ism is you have these are lines that are drawn up yeah in society intersectionality is what it's called right look you've got these lines drawn up it's um black lives matter versus black trans lives matter right like they're two different things it's division right? and right. It's division div- destroys absolutely it's, divide and conquer right it's like heterosexual versus homosexual okay well you can compare you can look at your own life and say yeah in my opinion my sin you know i am a sinner but it's not as bad as that person yeah. right or mm. yeah you know like i am a sinner but at least i have the right religion your religion is clearly wrong or you know there's so many different lines yeah. that you can draw up and it's always comparing uh, one person to another, right? And one group of people to another. Yeah. And in society, we love these divisions, but in the word of God, there's only one division, right? And that's, are you in Adam or are yes. you in Christ? Yeah. Right? And that's in Romans 5. Do you want to 
Yeah, maybe read it. And th- and that's a that's a thing that really irritates me is that it seems like the and I think we talked about it a bit with Stephen last time, but the church seems to be always behind, right? And they're always trying to catch up with the culture, you know, and and it, like even with this critical race stuff, right? Black Lives Matter. More and more, of the mainstream churches are preaching that right, now, right, right. you know. And and we read from Colossians three, right? And you're either in Adam or in Christ. And when you are in Christ, there's unity. There is no barbarian or a Greek or a Jew or or anything. You're all one in Christ. You're and, equal, even though you might have different things to do societally, right? You might have different things yeah. to do, like men don't have babies. Apparently, there's a new emoji coming out with a pregnant man, which is insane. But mm. men don't have babies. But still, the man is still e- is still equal with his wife, even though they have different roles. Yeah. Right. The wife has the baby. The man maybe you know cares for the family, right? And that's yeah. his primary job. But but they're equal under Christ. There is no. Yeah, and, and and that's where it gets ridiculous. I don't think we have it as bad as in Canada. Like we don't have. Well, it's there. I mean, you have Japanese only churches, right? But to to segregate people by by race in the church. Is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. That's that's totally unbiblical. What verse was that again? Um, Romans five, um, and then twelve through twenty-one. Okay, and that that shows the division. Mm-hmm. Therefore, just as sin, starting verse twelve. Ger- therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who is to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Um, therefore, verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Right. So this is the, the true division. All of us, every man and woman, has been born fallen. We're totally depraved. We have sin from birth and we're born in Adam. Like we, we inherit that, uh, that brokenness spiritually, emotionally, mm-hmm. physically, Yep. which essentially leads to death and all of those things. We die uh, physically, we die emotionally, right? We collapse in on ourselves yep. and we die spiritually. And this is the promise that God gave for all who sin against him, that you will die. Right? Yes. So we're born and we start dying that very moment. Um, no, we're actually born spiritually dead. We're born spiritually yeah. dead and we're, we're born physically and emotionally dying. Yeah. Right, we're we're falling apart. We're dying. Right, so that's it's like a picked flower, right? You know, like you cut the flower and it looks nice for a while, but eventually it wilts yep. and it's it gets tossed into the garbage. Right, this is the nature that we're born into in Adam. Right, it affects our our very nature, our DNA. Our bodies break down, and we are unable to uh save ourselves now what we're trying to do in culture and in society and when we compare one person to another is we're trying to save ourselves it's like yeah you know i'm bad but at least i'm not as bad as pete yeah i mean like that guy tunes pianos he's crazy he doesn't have a shave (laughs) no right like i'm better than him i'm 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 using my made-up righteousness yeah to elevate myself up and make myself feel better but at the very core, I know that I'm a sinner, mm-hmm. right? And this is then 
where the gospel comes in to help us to realize that we are sinners, that we have broken God's law, that we deserve death, and that that's eventually where we're going. We cannot save ourselves, and we need the grace of God to step in and save yeah. us. And Jesus steps in. We believe on him in faith. If we hear the gospel and believe, we're made new. We've yeah. been given a new life, and now we start to go the other way. Right? We've mm -hmm. become now like a seed that's planted in the ground. First Corinthians 15 talks about that. We become the seed that when we die, we sprout to eternal life with Christ, with no more pain, no more death. Now we're worshipers of God. We have, that's the only division that we have. Yeah. And anyone who is a Christian who is saved cannot boast about that, comparing themselves to someone else yeah. because they received it by grace. Yeah, and ultimately, when you become a Christian, you realize the standard is God's holiness. Right. Not that I'm better than my neighbor. Right. Or I'm not so bad. When you start comparing yourself to God, then you realize right. it's hopeless. Right? Absolutely. You're an undone sinner. And when you trust and believe in Jesus Christ and are born again, right. then there is no division with yeah. your neighbor anymore. Yeah. Like your fellow Christian, you're, yeah. you're all equal. Your skin color or your... Uh, your history or your your culture that you come right. out of that makes no difference. Yeah. You're all that. Colossians three is clear on that. Right. You know, barbarian, city, and Jew, Greek. Yeah, they're all one. And and Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. And you know, when you're in communion with the brethren around that, yeah, there there's unity there. Yeah. It's communion. There there yeah. can be no division right. around the Lord's table. Yeah. And that's why it's really annoying when churches start pushing right. this division. Yeah. You know, and, and you hear people that say, oh, I'm only going to go to a black church or right. a Here, Jewish here's, church or a white the, church. Or... Here's the communion table for all the European descent people. Yeah. And there's the communion table for it's the unbiblical. natives. Yeah. You know, like Christ says, I will, when, they will be one. Right. When you, when you talk that way, um, you know, we, we, you can make that example and you can say, God, it's crazy. Is it? Well, we're doing it. You think, well, wow, we would never do that. Well, I know of churches around here that have one service for the non-masked and one for the masked. Yeah. There's another division. Now, we, we are going to actually yeah. be talking about this in the next couple of weeks with another, another interview guest called Dr. Jason Garwood. We're going to talk about medical tyranny and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And we're, we're going to get way more into it. But at the end of the day, regardless of how we want to divide, the church is breaking God's law by by having the church separate and go into different areas of a church building to worship God, one yeah. without masks and one with. Yeah, and and the, right? the, the devil loves it because he uh, destroys yeah. the church by division. Yeah, throughout all history, you can see that's why there's so denom so many denominations right. and 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 that even with COVID, uh, yeah. how the div the division of yeah. you know. Government says we wear a mask. Yeah. Do we obey the government? Yeah. And that's, it's really wreaked havoc, I think, in, yeah. the, in the church over the last year. Absolutely. And, and we can't have that because yeah. if you're abiding in Christ in the vine, yeah. you know, your root, you're just yeah. a branch of that. Yeah. And you should all be unified in, in right. Christ. It's, it's annoying. It's, yeah. it, and it's sinful the way a lot of these mainstream churches and maybe smaller churches, but you don't hear of them that are dividing over all these issues. Yeah. It's uh, a lot of it, I think, is due to lack of knowledge. You know, you're not basing your beliefs in faith. You're not being biblical. You're not obeying the commandments. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not saying God says this. That's what I have yeah. to do. And Stephen says we have to go outside of that. He mentioned that, but it, it's difficult. Yeah, because we're like in the in the early church, you, it was basically the Christians against secular society, against the pagans. I mean, they had the Jews a bit. Yeah, but it seems like nowadays we're we're fighting against mainstream Christianity yeah. plus the secular society, and there's so many Christians that have been wrongly taught and influenced. Right, and they're stuck. So it's even more difficult than what we're going through yeah. now. To try get people to come back to a, a biblical yeah. Christianity. It is true. I think it's important for us to do our 
to do our study of or a case study of uh, life during the Roman Empire and how mm-hmm. the church grew up during that time. There is a book called The Rise of Christianity by, I think his name's Rodney Stark, mm. which I read uh, this past year. It was an amazing book, just a really good book to show wh- how the Christian influence increased as the Roman society collapsed. Because it's inevitable to collapse, yeah. right? Because it was pagan, it was... But their, their biggest thing, the Romans' biggest thing was, you can do whatever you want, so long as your worship of your God doesn't become political in the broader sense, which it doesn't interfere with Caesar is Lord. Yep. Jesus is a little Lord under the big Caesar. The Christians were saying, no. like So we've got to do that today. It's happening now too. Right. But we've also got to fight against uh, essentially an apostate church as well as another enemy. Yeah. Right. The we see it throughout uh, Christianity qu- happening quite often. We have the Reformation in you know in the 1500s, but how much was reformed? It didn't reform the Catholic Church. It left it, yeah. It left it, but it didn't change that much. It was some things that they sorted out, but for the most part, a lot of it carried on going the same way. Yeah. And it it's good. I mean, you can see it's progressing towards God's end, but also it was very flawed. And and now we almost need to have another Reformation. You're not going to reform the reformed church. There has to be something new coming out of that. Yeah. And we have to realize that there's a lot of work to be done, especially we do live in a, a nation that was that has some major historical issues when it came to uh, how they treated native people that were in the land. Same thing in the States with... Uh, how they treated uh, native yeah. people and also the the black slavery problem mm-hmm. there is an issue there right we can't make reparations but we as christians do need to figure out ways to step in and start working culturally to undo the damage that was done by non-christians non-christian governments non-christian people claiming to be christians yeah right this is a sacrifice that we have to make you know, oh, it's not our problem it's not our fault I know, but you still have this section of society which is pretty much untouched by <clears throat> by the gospel. It's an unreached people group yep. that live. I mean, we we're um, right next to Canada's largest reservation, the Blood Tribe, <clears throat> yep. Kainai, and Standoff. That's the largest by area reservation in Canada, and they're right yes. on our doorstep, and they're unreached with the gospel. Yeah. Right, because it's, they've had such a bad taste put in their mouth throughout history and generation of actually non-Christian influence, yep. statism, and evil and separations and walls. Yep. Right. That that it's we have to work so much harder to undo that before yep. we can then step in and actually make a difference. Yeah, because right? Christ's name has been blasphemed through a false Christianity uh, doing evil things and. Absolutely. and we notice it on the streets yeah. when we talk to people. They bring that up lots, you mm-hmm. know, and, and it's difficult because you got to separate yourself, yeah. <laughs> sorry, from the You've church, gotta, you know. You, well, you got to explain yeah. that. You have to make a distinction at least, don't you? A true Christian is a follower yeah. of Christ. Yeah. And if you love Christ, he says, you will obey my commandments. You will obey my laws, yeah. yeah. And that's key. And I think that's, and that's why it's, when churches are pushing this type of separation like with critical race and they're they're destroying the church yeah you know and they're going against god and yeah. then they're apostate yeah you know and and we have to get out of that yeah and um it, it's beyond reforming i think it just it's the new wines new wine yeah. skin you, you can never convince yeah. these yeah. people because yeah. A lot of them, I think, they just do it to keep their churches going. You know, it's, yeah. it's like a, it's their little church here. They're building their own little kingdom, and that's important to them. Not the, like we said at the beginning, if your first goal is not the glory of God, then you run into these issues. Then I, it becomes your own, this is my church. I know? always feel like being very conciliatory when it comes to this conversation because I've spent a lot of time uh, not fully understanding. Mm-hmm. No, I'm, I'm not saying I fully understand everything now, 
No. But what I'm saying is, is that you're to uh, uh, understand it progressively more and more. Yep. So I look at, uh, you know, modern Christians and, you know, if Jerusalem was the central hub of the Jewish faith, well, Nazareth was the backwater country. Yep. You know, they, and we, we've, we've gone culturally uh, in the Western world, what used to be very strongly Christian, we're essentially the backwater now. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you go to somewhere like Iran <clears throat> or China, these Christians are legit. Mm -hmm. right? They are facing persecution. They're preaching the gospel. They're <clears throat> enacting God's law in their in their groups and stuff like that. But in the West, we... Well, Christian we, has become a cultural <clears throat> thing. Right. And that, uh, that happened in the early church, too, when the church became state and the persecution right. was over. Yeah. Then it was cool to be a Christian. Yeah. You know, and there was no weight to yeah. your Christianity. Yeah. There was no commitment. Yeah. You know, being baptized publicly... Yeah. was the thing to do, yeah. you know, and I think the churches now have that too. So I think that we're very much ignorant, is what I'm trying to say. Ignorant mm -hmm. as the, the modern uh, pew-sitting Christian is ignorant to what the biblical faith even looks like. And the fact yeah. that they're pew-sitting and that they think that, you know, pew-sitting is the majority of what it means to be a Christian um, shows that they haven't been taught it well and that's the thing i mean we don't want to bash churches or people or anything but these if you're a minister of god or a teacher the word of god puts a huge responsibility yeah. on you you are you know even in ezekiel it says you know the the blood of your hearers is required of you right you know, and, and we we should be preaching, like they say, for an audience of one. Like, yeah. does God approve our message? We're ambassadors of Christ. Yeah. We should be bringing only his message and not, when the culture changes, try and make God's word to fit. Right. You know, like pulling all things out of the Bible to make critical race, race theory make sense. Absolutely. Or, or transgenderism or gay marriage. It's all involved with that. You know, are yeah. you seeking god's honor in what you're doing yeah. or are you just trying to build your own yeah. your own group and a lot of christians suffer you know yeah. that they don't have the proper teaching and uh i have good hope that's going to change yeah well I, I think that the promise is that it'll change um we have a pr we have promises within the bible that promise that god's kingdom will prevail mm. and that the kingdom of this world you know um atheistic state or or some something else like a secular humanist state is designed to fail like god has built it in yeah. to fail um we need to recognize that and i think the call for us would be for christians and christian pastors and christian churches to recognize that we're always moving in god's kingdom towards a more glorious day yeah that all of the enemies of christ will be put under his feet that's 1 Corinthians 15, 25. It's one of my favorite portions of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15, is that all of God's enemies will be put under his feet and the last enemy to be defeated with death. So if yeah. you're the type of Christian that's constantly thinking, oh, when's Jesus going to come back and just waiting for the rapture? Okay, how about you put an enemy or you are used by Christ and you step into that space, wherever it is, to put an enemy of Christ under his feet because the last enemy to be defeated is death. So look at your situation that you have around you. Lethbridge, we have a homeless and drug addiction problem. Definitely. I've yep. said it so many times that the church, the people of God, organized together, could end this in one year. We could Oh yeah, easy. We could smash a huge dent out of it. We have the money, we have the people, we have the word of God, That's and we have so the spirit of God, which is the most important thing. Yep. We could absolutely put that enemy of homelessness and drug addiction under the feet of Jesus, it wouldn't cost the taxpayer anything. Nope. Right? And, and the best thing would be it would bring glory to God's name. It yep. would bring salvation to sinners, and the world would see, wow, Christianity right. is real. Right. You know, and, and that's, we read it a while back from Deuteronomy where the nations around Israel said, wow, what an amazing God and what amazing laws he gives you. Right. Because your society is 
Beautiful. So that when people come into your country, they come into your city, they move there, is because it's glorious. It honors God. Yeah. They might not even necessarily believe in God or be Christians, but say, like, "Wow, this is amazing." Yeah. That's why I'm going there. Yeah. Right. We can do this as a church in Lethbridge, and we have to do this. And it's it's not okay for us to sit back and not mm -hmm. uh, solve this problem. There are individual Christians that are trying to work on this, but yeah. we need to get together a concerted effort to really understand the problem and attack it and put that enemy under the feet of Jesus. And that's discipling yeah. the nations. <clears throat> yeah. What he's saying. But just yeah. doing what Jesus commands us to do. Right. And then the nations will automatically see the, the right. amazingness and the glory of that. That it's once you see it, you know, <clears throat> and you start to realize how it all works together right. and you <clears throat> just take God at his word mm -hmm. and you just let go of all these secondary issues yeah but you know what about multiculturalism and people that don't want to believe and yeah you know it all falls under that romans 5 yeah you're either adam in christ and, or in yeah, adam exactly. you know and it's jesus says all authority is his on earth and yeah. in heaven and mm -hmm. and we don't have the option of not believing that as a christian right you know we're we're if you're you're ambassador of christ yeah. it's his word that's going to change and we shouldn't try mix in cultural changes right into our christian thinking mm -hmm. just stick with the bible and stick that's with the, law the safe, yeah. safest way yeah no this is really good i think that uh this is something that we have to keep banging on about <laughs> um yeah. you know i don't know how many people are, are watching how many people are listening um but we've got to keep on calling the church yeah now maybe you're in a in a a church in another city Right? What's what mm -hmm. should you be doing? You should be figuring out what the biggest problem is in your city, and as a church, try to attack that problem. It's not yeah. always going to be the same problem, but there's so many enemies of Christ to be put under His feet: yeah. homelessness, drug addiction, um, uh, lack of caring, um, problems with mask mandates, and all kinds of different things like that, or whatever it is. Like, there's so many different problems to be put under the feet. Murder, like, there's some cities that are rife with murders and yep. theft and all kinds of stuff. You need to step in and solve those problems as yeah. a society, as a and Christian I think, society, right? Uh, the biggest problem Christians have is um, beginning in your own family. Mm -hmm. You know, transforming your own family by right. by preaching the gospel to them and, mm -hmm. and living out this in your family mm -hmm. and start there because mm -hmm. a lot of times we can you know we can do other things too but we right. should never forget our family yeah. our local church and yeah. then move out into our local cities governments you know yeah because like if the family isn't solid how can the church be yeah and, and even the, the bible brings up like to be an elder yeah or a deacon you have to if you can't control your own family right you shouldn't be out there yeah you know i think and that not only in the church but also in society it just yeah. makes sense yeah. you practice what you preach right your 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 life yeah is a light to the world yeah and that's really important do you want to read psalm 2 yeah sure the first <clears throat> few verses at least the first uh uh how come you always get to read is it because you're the more spiritual one? Is it because your Bible has bigger <clears throat> and it has more leather around it? No, it's just because um, <clears throat> you talk more. So you're just trying to get some more. Then at least I can do something. Okay. So. <laughs> I don't know. You talked a lot in this episode. Yeah, I did. Do you want to read? No, that's then? fine. Yeah, let me do it. Okay. Um, maybe maybe people would think that I can't read. Uh, yeah, you know? I doubt that, but and... it's possible. <laughs> All right, Psalm two. Why do the nations rage? And the peoples plot in vain and the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst apart their bonds and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion my holy hill i will tell of the decree the lord said to me you are my son today i have begotten you ask of me and i will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possessions you shall break them with the rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel now therefore o kings 
Be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So this psalm mm. is just an amazing promise, and it's already being enacted. He's doing this right now, is to yep. recognize that without God, if you're going to be a ruler, or even a ruler of your own life, an individual, without God, it's destined to fail. You yep. will get wrecked if you will break God's law all day, every day. And of course, our nature is that we will. Yep. We have to recognize that we need to kiss the sun. Right? We need to, to kiss the sun and bow down to him yep. and recognize that he is the king and that he's the ruler of all nations and that he, he owns all of this. He created it. He created yep. it. He redeemed it. And he's redeeming it. Yeah. Right? And we don't so, always see it in our lifespan. Yeah. You know, we're, we live 50, 60, 80 years. But if you look back in history, you can see that all societies always destroyed themselves. Yeah. You know, and that's what's happening in our society now. It's just, it's just destroying each other. It is. You know, and it, it, it won't end well. And there's a beautiful promise there at the end, you know, blessed are all who take right. refuge in him. You know, that's amazing right so you can see your your own life individual life is god's wrath will be kindled against you if you don't kiss the sun yeah but at the same time blessed are you who do and take refuge in him it's the same yeah. for our culture it's the same for our nature for our nation yep you know or nations around the world whatever however we want to see that is that when we kiss the sun as a society when we follow him uh he raises up and does something new and he brings about his kingdom in a new way in this world as people start to obey follow him be transformed um, and given the power to obey his law and start to enact his righteous laws in society and build society around his word yep then it all gets better and it that will. we can see the enemies be putting under his feet yeah so that when christ returns in that day in the future that glorious day we are a spotless bride Mm -hmm. not a haggard like yeah just disease ridden yeah and, and dressed in tatters bride and the right? thing is, is is we're working right it's like we're coming into port with all sails flying right instead of rusty yeah, dilapidated yeah, 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 yeah. boat yeah comes limping in no yeah. one you know we could be messed up but still we're yeah doing the work of god that's yeah. a beautiful thing that yeah. you could instead of rusting out that you yeah. could wear out for for the kingdom of god yeah calvin put it pretty well when he talks about the broken mirror we're like a mirror that's smashed we're, we're supposed to reflect the glory yeah. of god back but we're like a mirror that's been broken but through salvation god is or through sanctification god is piecing us back mm -hmm. together and he's putting that mirror back together so that we can reflect him more and more and that his kingdom can come more and more and yes. that's the the promise good all right that's we'll it. End it here. You can do your peace thing. Uh, hippie, hippie peace thing. <laughs> okay. Well, I get back from BC and I'm a hippie now. Yeah, well, you always do. Peace. Oh, oh. well, I'm going to do it. Good. Um, so this has been the Post Mill Podcast, Engaging the Culture with God's Justice with Pete. Yes. And Scott. Peace. Thanks for listening.